Composite members are structural members that are composed of two materials, structural steel and reinforced concrete. Strictly speaking, any structural member formed with two or more materials is composite. In buildings and bridges, however, that usually means structural steel and reinforced concrete, and that usually means composite beams or columns. Composite behavior in beams is achieved by connecting the steel beam to the reinforced concrete slab it supports, causing the two parts to act as a unit. In a floor or roof system, a portion of the slab acts with each steel beam to form a composite beam consisting of the rolled steel shape and augmented by a concrete flange at the top. This unified behavior is possible only if horizontal slippage between the two components is prevented. That can be accomplished if the horizontal shear at the interface is resisted by connecting devices known as anchors, sometimes called shear connectors. These devices, which can be steel-headed studs or short lengths of small steel channel shapes, are welded to the top flange of the steel beam at prescribed intervals and provide the connection mechanically through anchorage in the hardened concrete. Studs are the most commonly used type of anchors and more than one can be used at each location if the flange is wide enough to accommodate them, which depends on the allowable spacing. One reason for the popularity of steel-headed stud anchors is their ease of installation. It is essentially a one-worker job made possible by an automatic tool that allows the operator to position the stud and weld it to the beam in one operation. A certain number of anchors will be required to make a beam fully composite. Any fewer than this number will permit some slippage to occur between the steel and concrete. Such a beam is said to be partially composite. In this video, we will discuss only fully composite beams. Most composite construction in buildings utilizes formed steel deck, which serves as a formwork for the concrete slab and is left in place after the concrete cures. This metal deck also contributes to the strength of the slab. The deck can be used with its ribs oriented either parallel or perpendicular to the beams. In the usual floor system, the ribs will be perpendicular to the floor beams and parallel to the supporting girders. The studs are welded to the beams from above through the deck. Since the studs can be placed only in the ribs, their spacing along the length of the beam is limited to multiples of the rib spacing. Almost all highway bridges that use steel beams are of composite construction, and composite beams are frequently the most economical alternative in buildings. Although smaller, lighter rolled steel beams can be used with composite construction, this advantage will sometimes be offset by the additional cost of the studs. Even so, other advantages may make composite construction attractive. Shallower beams can be used and deflections will be smaller than with conventional non-composite construction. Flexural and shearing stresses in beams of homogeneous materials can be computed from the following formulas. A composite beam is not homogeneous, however, and these formulas are not valid. To be able to use them, we can theoretically convert the concrete into an amount of steel that has the same effect as the concrete. This procedure requires the strains in the fake steel to be the same as those in the concrete it replaces. If the slab is properly attached to the rolled steel shape, the strains will be as shown with cross sections that are plain before bending, remaining plain after bending. However, because the modulus of elasticity of concrete differs from that of steel, the stress distribution will not be linear and continuous, with a jump happening at the interface between steel and concrete. 
we first require that the strain in the concrete at any point be equal to the strain in any replacement steel at that point. AISC I2.1B gives the modulus of elasticity of concrete as the unit weight of concrete to the power of 1.5 multiplied by the square root of the 28-day compressive strength of the concrete. To determine the area of steel that will resist the same force as the concrete, divide the concrete area by the ratio of elastic modulus of steel to that of the concrete called N. To transform the concrete area A sub C, we must divide by N. The most convenient way to do this is to divide the width by N and leave the thickness unchanged. Doing so results in the homogeneous steel section shown. To compute stresses, we locate the neutral axis of this composite shape and compute the corresponding moment of inertia. We can then compute bending stresses with the flexure formula at the top of the steel and at the bottom of the steel, where M is the applied bending moment and I sub TR is the moment of inertia about the neutral axis. The stress in the concrete may be computed in the same way, but because the material under consideration is steel, the result must be divided by N, such that maximum stress in the concrete is equal to the applied moment multiplied by the furthest distance of the concrete from the neutral axis divided by N times the moment of inertia. This procedure is valid only for a positive bending moment with compression at the top because concrete has negligible tensile strength. In the next video, we will discuss how to find the neutral axis. In addition, how to calculate the stresses in the steel as well as in the concrete and how to determine the composite section's flexural strength. We will also explore how to determine the width of the concrete slab that will contribute to the composite member. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.